Hi everybody, welcome to the next installment of Statistics in Pajamas. We're now moving on to modeling where we're trying to actually predict an outcome and we'll start with a simple linear regression. Regression really is very similar to the correlations we just covered and actually when you see the formulas for a slope and intercept you'll recognize just how similar they are. But basically that's because regression is built on the same principles. We know that some variables share common variability, therefore if we know something about one of them we should be able to make predictions about the other. Our goal is to figure out the best equation that we can use to take that information from one of the variables and predict the other. And that can range from very simple models like this example where we're trying to take a high school GPA and predict your first year GPA, but it can be extended to as many variables as you want. So essentially what regression is doing is it's just trying to come up with the equation that best approximates your outcome from whatever inputs you have. And then we also have to make sure that we're quantifying how accurately that equation works and how robust it would be if we had totally new data. And we'll talk about how to evaluate these regression uh, models in a little bit, but we'll start just by going over the basic equation. In this class, we're basically going to just cover linear regression, but there are other regression models for nonlinear relationships. But because this is a simple linear regression, you should recognize this formula, right? This is akin to your y equals mx plus b. This is your formula for a line, any line. But what we're doing is we're taking our x variable and we're trying to figure out this coefficient, this weighting that we could multiply it by and then the intercept that we should add it to to be able to predict the other variable, y. And then notice this e tacked onto the end. That's because there's always going to be error associated with your prediction. Your prediction is never going to be exactly right on. Because we're trying to calculate the line of best fit. In other words, how can we um, place this line amongst all of these different observations, these points in here, such that that error term is as small as possible. So that would be the line of best fit. This approach to regression is called a least squares regression because essentially what we're trying to do is find out where we can place this line to minimize these errors. So what that means is we have to figure out what this intercept value is, this beta naught, and what this coefficient or weighting is for our independent measured value. And there's a very simple formula, which as I promised, looks very similar to the correlations that we went over before. And this beta 1 is essentially equivalent to your slope. It's the weighting for that x value. There's no fancy calculus or, or complex matrix algebra in here. It's simply just taking the sum of your x's and y's, the sum of the squares, the sum of the products. And then again, because we are doing an inferential statistical test, we have to include our sample size in there so that we can uh, affect the power of the analysis that we are running. So the first thing you have to do is calculate the slope because notice that to calculate the intercept you actually have to include the slope value in there. You should be able to look at these and recognize what they're doing. Right? So, so when you see a formula where you have your x and y products, you know that you're doing something very similar to what you were doing with the correlation, but the difference is that there's no square root in the denominator for your slope in here. I'll show you the correlation formula. Okay, here you go. So I've just added this in. Notice how similar these two equations are. The way that I remember is just that the correlation has the square root in the denominator here, whereas the slope does not. And then the intercept is easy to see because it's the only formula we have that asks for a beta value or a coefficient. One of the things that we have to do is an actual significance test so that we can figure out if this model, this coefficient multiplied by one of those variables can account for enough of the total variability to be considered beyond just what's randomly possible. And then we also need to figure out how much error is associated with this model. 
And just to demonstrate how similar regression and correlation is, the significance test to determine whether or not you have a significant model is just the simple correlation test. So if you have a significant correlation between your x, your independent, and your y, that's your dependent response variable, if that correlation is significant, then you have a significant model. But how about model meaningfulness. Well, again, very similar to the correlation. All you have to do is square that correlation value, and that will give you your R squared, which tells you how much of the total variability in the data can be accounted for by that relationship. So when we're talking about regression, the way that you can, can rephrase that is, how much of the variability in my response can I tell from my independent input variable? Okay, so we've got our model with the slope and the intercept. We know if it's significant. And now we can also talk about whether or not it's meaningful. But we need to estimate the error. And the way that we do that with regression is we essentially try to calculate a standard deviation of all of the error scores. That's sort of literally what we're doing. And there's a very simple formula for that. It's called the root mean square error. So all we have to do is take each of our actual response values, so each dependent observation value, and find out how different that is from the predicted value. So y prime is the, the y we would have if we just used the equation. See how different those are. This is your error. You're basically quantifying your error. Square it because we don't care if it's positive or negative get an average by, uh, well, a conservative average by using the sample size minus 1, and then take the square root to put it back in the same units. This is our root mean square error, and it's literally just telling us, on average, how far off is our prediction. And because this is in the exact same units as your response variable, you can literally interpret it as how far off am I for whatever my unit of response is. The smaller your root mean square error, the better, but it's still relative because you may have a large root mean square error, but maybe it's only because the typical response value is a really big number to begin with. And so what we do to interpret our root mean square error is we calculate the proportion of error. So if we take our root mean square error and we divide it by the mean of the response, we're going to come up with a percent error rate. And that's going to help us interpret how robust or how accurate that model really is. So those are your regression basics, and we could stop right there. But of course, I want to know that you all are doing your regression modeling well, not just doing it. So there are a couple other considerations that you always have to have in the back of your mind when you are running a regression model. And the first thing is to remember that this is only going to work for linear relationships. So your first step should always be to look at a scatter plot and see whether or not you really do look like you have a linear relationship here. The other thing you want to consider is what's the range of values that you cover with your calibration data. So when we're talking about calibration, we're talking about all of the observations that actually go into calculating the formula for your regression. That's your calibration data. And your regression is only ever going to be valid for that same range of input data that you have. And so here's a really interesting example. So if I have something that looks like this, I might be able to say, well, look at my range. I have values in my calibration data set from about 2 all the way out to 25. So my model should be valid for any input variables I have between 2 and 25, right? Well, you have to think a little bit more closely. Does this one observation and then nothing in between that really represent what's happening with the relationship in this range? I would argue probably not. And that maybe this model is really only valid from, say, 2 to 4, where I know I have the bulk of my observations. So you want to ex examine your data also to get an idea of what that range looks like and, and what range of input values you think that model will still work for because anything that happens outside of your range of collected data you don't know that that relationship could change we have no data to help us quantify that so we have to be very conservative in what we're applying our model to
The other concern is very similar to the correlations again in that outliers can be very highly influential on our regression model. So if we do have outliers, it can have very high leverage. And what that means is that it could be influencing the calculation of our slope and our intercept. Just one observation could completely change what those coefficients are. And so these are called high leverage points, meaning that you know, like for example, this one right here, even though it's only one observation and you have all of these other observations that follow a similar relationship, the presence of this one high leverage point can actually change drastically my slope and intercept that I calculate. So that's just a visual estimate. But you can also go back to those residual plots like we did with correlations and they'll help you identify those really extreme observations that again are not just extreme for the one variable but are extreme for the relationship. Aside from this visual analysis there are other ways that we can quantify uh, to um, high leverage and identify those outliers that might be overly influencing our regression model. And one of those is a Cook's distance metric, often called Cook's D. And you see, you see it in this jump output from the save columns, Cook's D influence option in the magic red triangle. And essentially what Cook's D is doing is it's quantifying how much leverage, right? how much influence what a single or any single observation has on the regression equation itself. And so obviously we would like to have this Cook's D value be as low as possible for all of our observations. But what's really interesting is if you do have truly high leverage points, they will be significantly higher than the others. So again, it's not like I can give you a, a threshold of, oh, if your Cook's D is below 10, you're fine. But if your Cook's D is over 10, you're not. It's not like that. You have to look for essentially outliers in this Cook's distance metric. So you would create a whole new column that gives you a Cook's D value for every single observation and then you would look for those extremely high Cook's D values. So even if you've identified them as being outliers and they have high leverage, it doesn't mean that you can just pull out that observation without asking yourself a few more questions. And I usually start first off with data quality. Is this just erroneous? Is it wrong data? If the data quality is bad, then yes, I want to take it out for sure because it's bad data. But if I don't think that I have something wrong with that data point, I still need to ask myself a few other questions. For example, is there some reason why this observation doesn't fit? For example, maybe it's just way outside of that working range we just talked about of our model. And so we just don't think we've captured that relationship within the other data points. If I'm essentially saying that I don't think my model works at this range way up here, and I'm only going to use the model for values that fall in this lower range down here, then of course I want to remove that because I'm only trying to model what's happening down there. Another way that you can test whether or not you want to take out a high leverage point is to actually take it out and see how your model changes. So if you run it with that outlier in there, that high leverage outlier and without, and your model doesn't change, then it's probably fine to leave it in. But if the whole relationship changes, you definitely want to pull that out because that one observation is essentially masking the relationship that's demonstrated by all of those other observations. Another option of whether or not you can take these high leverage outliers out is to run an independent validation. An independent validation means that it's essentially you go back to your data set and instead of using all of your observations to create the regression model to calculate that slope and that intercept, you leave a random subset out. So maybe you would pull out every fourth observation and you save those and you take the model that you come up with with the other three quarters of the observations and you use that model to predict on the independent set. And then you can go back and see how accurate you were with that set. 
So if you find that with that high leverage point in there, you still have a highly accurate independent validation result, then your model is probably fine. But if your independent validation is horrific, then that's probably telling you that that high leverage point is not really helping you capture the relationship for the larger population. So this independent validation, it's the best way to go to assess any model. But the problem is researchers have found that if you do that, if you're always pulling out and holding holding back a uh, proportion of your possible calibration data, you actually can't develop as good a model. Right? The more observations you have, the more representative you are of the whole population. And so they've, they've created another way that we can approximate independent validation without having to exclude any of our observations in the initial calibration. And that's by using jackknife residuals. Jackknife residuals essentially take every single observation in your data set and one at a time it takes one observation out, creates a regression model, and then puts it back in, takes out the next observation, creates a regression model, puts it back in, takes out the third observation. It does this over and over again until it essentially has as many regression models as you have observations. And it uses all of those to come up with the best mean coefficient for slope and for intercept. And also what it does is each time it leaves one of those observations out, it uses the model that's created to predict that one observation that was left out. And then you can use the mean of all of the errors associated with those predictions to come up with what we call a jackknife residual. So the residual is the leftover, the error. And so we can see how different every single one of these observations is when it's left out one at a time and get an idea of how our model might work for an independent set of observations. We're essentially trying to approximate independent validation. And this number, the sum of all of those residuals of those uh, sequentially removed observations is called the press statistic. And if we take that and we divide it by n minus 1, and we get the press root mean square error. So we can compare this press or the jackknifed root mean square error to our actual root mean square error to get an idea of how robust our model is. In other words, how well is it likely to have worked on an independent validation set? So how do you interpret that? Well, obviously the smaller your press statistic, the better but it's really that press root mean square error that we want. So on average, how far off were our jackknife residuals from their actual value? And typically, the way that we can interpret whether or not we have a robust model, and when I say robust, I mean that it not only works for the data that was used to calibrate it, it should also work on completely new observations. That's what I mean by robust. And we can assume we have a robust model if that press root mean square error isn't any more than one and a half times the root mean square error. We want these two to be very similar. But once your press is inflated beyond one and a half times the root mean square error, you probably have an unstable model that no matter how good your p-values are or your r-squareds are, is probably not going to be useful at all to you not for predicting, which is what regression is all about. So when you're doing a paragraph summary to write up everything that's important about your regression model, there's a lot of information in here. So these paragraphs might be a little bit longer than what we've had in the past. So we know we have to report the equation. That's the whole point of regression modeling. Tell us what equation we can use to make a prediction about one value based on a measurement of another. So you have to include that intercept value and the coefficient value and tell us what that actual uh, equation is. We want to know how significant that model is, so give us the probability associated with that value. If you're doing it by hand, this is the significance, the p-value for your correlation. Give us the R squared, which tells us how much of the total variability in the data you can explain by using your independent variable to predict the Y variable, the response variable. Give us the root mean square error, um, which is also reported right up here. And again, that tells us on average how far off our predictions are. 
give us the press root mean square error so that we can see how stable our model is, right? How does that press root mean square error compare to our root mean square error? And here is actually an example of an incredibly unstable model. The press root mean square error is 47 compared to the root mean square error, which is 6. So clearly we have a model that's not working on independent data. And then you need to summarize um, basically whether or not you think this model is something that's going to work. What are your conclusions about um, the utility of this? Can people actually use it to make the predictions that it was designed to do? So all of this needs to be packaged into one nice and very concise paragraph. As I mentioned before, regression is not just limited to one variable predicting another. You can have many variables here. We have one input variable, x1. We have a different input variable, x2, and it's going to have its own coefficient associated with it. We can have as many input variables um, as we want, well, as long as we have enough observations uh, to be able to account for all the degrees of freedom that we need. But Theoretically, this multiple linear regression model could keep going and going. Each one of them is going to have a coefficient that we calculate for it, and then there's still going to be that one intercept value, and then of course all of the error that's left over when we try to predict our response. And what's really fun about regression is that it doesn't have to be just continuous uh, input variables. We even can use categorical variables as predictors by assigning dummy values to them. So just we won't be able to get into that again because it's an intro class, but just know that you could, for example, include gender as a predictor in one of your uh, regression models. And when I say that it gives it a dummy value, what that means is that even though it's categorical, it can give a value of zero to one of those classes and a value of one to the other class. So again, I just want you to be aware that you really can bring in these categorical variables as additional predictors, and it's actually super creative how they figured out how to do that. So this is no longer a simple linear regression. It's now a multiple linear regression, but it's doing the exact same thing. It's still trying to find the line of best fit, except with the multiple linear regression, it's not just a line. It's actually a multi-dimensional plane, right? So however many variables you have, that's how many dimensions you have to your equation. And we're trying to find the, the multivariate equation that can best fit all of that data. This is much more complex math that we will not get into, so we're just going to get into uh, how to apply this and how to interpret it. And so you need to be aware of a few things when you're now switching from a simple linear regression to a multiple linear regression. And one is that you have to make sure that all of those different input variables you're using to predict your response are not autocorrelated. And we talked about autocorrelation when we were doing the multiple correlations, and we used our partial correlations to figure out which of these many variables that are maybe all related to each other have the most unique impact on our response or the variable of interest. We have to make sure we're doing the same thing and that we're checking to make sure we don't have autocorrelation in the variables that we're using to predict our, predict our response. We also have to make sure that we're not just overfitting the model. And overfitting means that you're just throwing in so many predictor variables that you're covering every possible dimension of variability. And you could essentially have what looks like a perfect model just because you have so many terms in that equation. So a general rule of thumb is that you should have at least 10 observations for every input or predictor variable you use. So say, for example, I had 30 observations, but I had 10 different variables that I could pick from to predict my response that I'm interested in. But if I only have 30 observations, it means that I should not use any more than three of those input variables, even if more were significant. So my job is to figure out the best three to use for that model to make sure that I'm not overfitting. The autocorrelation is a little bit harder to, to detect, but luckily built right into jump, there is something called the variance inflation factor that we can get to be able to quantify whether or not we have autocorrelation among our input predictor variables. And I'm going to show you how to get to that. It's actually one of the few things that's not hidden in the magic red triangle, but that instead you have to right click for. So I will show you, uh, show you that when we actually go through some of our examples.
very fun. But just keep in mind that as you're doing this, you need to come up with the equation, but make sure that that equation isn't just overfitting, that you've examined any outliers or high leverage points and taken them out if you need to, that you can define and understand the range that your model is good for, that any of these multiple variables you're including on are not autocorrelated with each other, essentially, that there are no spurious correlations. And then you have to make sure that you are summarizing how many terms there were, that's how many variables ended up in your model, the R squared, how meaningful is this model, how much of the total variability can be accounted for, that root mean square error, in other words, how far off are our predictions, how accurate is our model, that variance inflation factor, which tells us whether or not we have any autocorrelation, and that press root mean square error, which gives us an idea of how robust our equation, our model is. So really, this is a lot of stuff that you have to summarize when you are creating a model and then trying to write up that model. So hopefully this has been a quick and easy introduction to regression. And I think I'm going to pause here and then start uh, a couple of examples uh, in this separate video so I can give you all a chance to, to wake up and uh, get ready for regressions in JUMP. So until next time.